We have with us this afternoon Mr. Glenn Renwick, UF Distinguished Alumnus and President and CEO of the Progressive Corporation. Thank you for being here with us this uh, afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks. What are the characteristics of a great leader? You know, it's, uh, it's something I've given a fair amount of thought to over the years, and of course we all have the benefit of reading other people's views and so on and so forth. But I think I've tried to form a few views uh, uh, based on experience. So I've got a couple, and I've sort of thought about these a little bit. And it's a great leader, I think, has a balance between several of the qualities that I'm going to point out. One is, and I start with the people at Progressive saying, it's easy to be number two. And what I mean by that is it's always easy to second guess someone else where a leader has to often make a decision with imperfect information. And if it was perfect information, the decision would make itself and there'd be no need for, for that position. But it's also critically important, uh, whether it's hierarchical or otherwise, there are leaders, informal leaders, and it's important to be a great number two and support a decision that's made. In a progressive, I always try to get people to realize a good decision made timely and executed well over any long period of time will outperform procrastination, perhaps no decision, or even if we had the benefit of knowing what the perfect decision was, and support it. So the first is sort of no win. It's not easy to be number two, but it's certainly not easy to be number one. And a lot of the things I do, I consult, but rather than just consulting to try and get to a consensus, which often can't happen, a leader must decide, and I think it's best to decide well in advance of consulting, who's the decision maker. So when you consult, it's clear you're consulting to, consulting to help you make your decision as opposed to trying to reach consensus, which sometimes can be a very confusing outcome for people when you don't make it the way that they perhaps offered. The second is uh, to have a great passion for what you're doing. You know, if you, if you simply don't have that passion, and it comes through in everything uh, that a leader does, and people detect that very easily. And that passion oftentimes will, will frankly allow you to make some mistakes. But those mistakes will be probably trivially small compared to the progress you make by having that sort of a, uh, a real passion and a pride. I, mean, I think that when I talk to people, at the end of the day, what we look back on, you won't remember the, the salary check or something or the level of promotion that seemed so important at the time, but you may end up with a great deal of pride of having been part of something far greater. So I think a leader's got to instill that. And third is sort of uh, don't paint by the numbers. I think a, a leader just simply can't paint by the numbers. I rather crudely distinguish leadership from management. Management is improving things with known outcomes. You can always improve. We can always do process improvement. That's hugely important, M much of what we do. Leadership is really sort of going somewhere that there isn't such a known outcome, and it's having that vision and having it constructed in a way that people want to follow you. Uh, sometimes painting outside the lines is civil disobedience, sometimes it's brilliance. And you've got to sort of find the right balance for those sorts of things. Uh, I'd also tell you that from a leader, it's important to internalize, and I think this for me has become something that I hope is becoming more obvious, is over any period of time you gauge your success by the people you hire and develop. Because at the end of the day, most businesses, regardless of whether it's intellectual property or machinery or whatever know-how it might be, it still comes down to people. And I think the kind of people that we can develop in, in our institutions and the leadership uh, that we provide to make sure that that is considered a fundamental outcome, not just a tangential outcome, is great. And hiring people, I often say, we've got to hire more people who don't yet believe what we're asking them to do can't be done. And as we do that, we have to sort of make sure, and I think it's a leader's responsibility, to make sure we hire a great diversity of people, diversity in every sense of the word, diversity of thought, diversity so people will look around corners in ways that we never looked around the corners before. And another, for me, important aspect of a, of a leader is really communicate all the time. And that seems so obvious, and on the surface of it, it is. But I think that if failure to communicate, and it happens in every walk of life, Voids get filled. If you don't say what you're doing or what you want an organization that you're leading to do, the voids will get filled. And often those voids get filled in ways that require correction, but it's too late. It's way too late. And the speed of communication today, um, for me, as I tell groups, communicating all the time allows you the credibility to be able to communicate in the bad times. If you just choose to communicate in the bad times, then 
you've sensitized a, a complete organization to think that any communication is sort of bad news as opposed to it's a continuum. There are some things that work really well. That's great. We should celebrate them. And in that communication, I think it's also important for a leader, as long as it's very genuine, to, to recognize people. People do. We are fundamentally human. We want appreciation. We want sort of some recognition for what we do. And I think if you do that in a very genuine and measured way, people really get a, a uh, I think we all get an appreciation to sort of say, yeah, I want to go back and do more of that. And the last one might sound a little strange, but uh, I think a leader has to take care of themselves. If, uh, mm -hmm. if a leader is not happy, then it's going to show through. You simply cannot be a leader if you don't have a balance in your life, you know, whatever that might mean for you. Uh, but some sense of balance and some sense of sense of who you are and what you're trying to do and not that you're trying to be something else, but keep a, a reasonable balance to all those qualities. Uh, to me, that's a few of the things I've taken away from being a leader anyway. Great insight. What are the greatest challenges you've faced as a leader? Uh, I like to think of about three situations. Uh, one, it's not always pleasant to talk about these, but sometimes that's when leadership issues come to the fore. We had a situation in California that I was uh, very much involved in. The law had passed, uh, passed a proposition actually, and insurance doesn't really matter the details, but it was becoming very clear that we could not operate at the size that we once were. So we were going to have to actually get to about half the size of our business. So we're talking about 600 people uh, reduction. Never a fun thing for a leader. Certainly not fun for anybody. So there's no, uh, there's no joy in this one. And I remember going through the process of trying to figure out how we should go about making the layoffs and staging them and so on and so forth. And I had a, uh, an insight that was provided to me, I believe, in more of a overheard in the hallway conversation. And it was sort of in the spirit. Unfortunately, I can't relate exactly what it was because it's a little bit old. But it was almost a matter of why don't they ask us. So I went back with my management team and I said, we're plotting this like a military operation, but we're missing variables. We really don't know what's going on in the minds of our own employees. They all know we have to do this. That's not a mystery. So we scrapped those plans and went back and asked people, we're going to have to lay off X number of people. We're going to do it over a period of about six to eight months. What is it that we should know about your interests in life? And I'll shortcut the story a little, but people gave us well, I was thinking of going back to school. My husband and I were thinking of starting a business. I'd be happy if I went here, if someone else could stay here. We were able to organize almost 50% of the people we needed to leave, so it met with their preference for things that they can do in life. So the insight was, had I done it, I'm sure I would not have got the ordering nearly as uh, accurately as it ultimately turned out to be a better solution for everybody all told. So for me, it was sort of no matter how hard the decision is, involve the people affected. And it does make the decision making harder, longer, but generally it can actually improve the results. Hmm. The second one, uh, we, uh, as you know, we're in the automobile insurance business and uh, Hurricane Katrina was a pretty uh, devastating event in uh, New Orleans. And uh, I visited New Orleans shortly after the hurricane, shortly after they would let people in. And here we have vehicles that were totally flooded. And you might say, well, if that was water, that'd be one thing. But it was everything. And for me, it was one of those situations when I suddenly realized, OK, everything that we do in insurance would say, we'll get those cars out, we'll dry them out, some of them will be taken away, used for parts or whatever. And some will probably be out of our control and may even find their ways back, back onto the roads, because uh, they'll look OK two weeks after they've been dried out. I made a decision that day, realizing that it is the time when leaders have to make decisions, not the decisions you just follow the protocol. We never took a car out of New Orleans. We brought in car crushers and crushed every car, which uh, sounds good unless you're watching a brand new Mercedes getting crushed or something like that. And I'll never know whether economically that was a good decision, but I do know that culturally inside of our company about sort of the values that we stand for, that it was a great example of doing the right thing at the right time. How did your engineering education prepare you for leadership? You know, that's always a tough one to sort of get the exact parallels, but I think the sort of discipline that we're asked to, uh, to apply to engineering problems and to uh, analytical problems has, has applied to not just the content or the technical skills of the business, but really in the leadership and management skills of the business. And I think I think through problems reasonably analytically. 
uh, try to apply that thinking, try to encourage other people to think through, try to think through unintended consequences. Uh, one, of the, one of the observations I make in many situations are we think through one part of the solution, the part that we would li most like to have happen, but we haven't always thought through unintended consequences. I think we see that in legislation and lawmaking and so on and so forth. And in business, I think it's a uh, discipline that you can take from engineering is to make sure you've thought through all the possible consequences, regardless, regardless of the probability of the event, so that you're comfortable that under any circumstances, that'll be a solution you'll be comfortable with. What other methods of leadership development were important in your growth as a leader? You know, I think picking up from other people. I, uh, I tell people at Progressive, especially new managers, the one thing I want them to be most is themselves. Uh, sometimes you promote people and they almost feel like, well, gee, now I've got to be a a different person than I was. And it's kind of like, well, that, that's really a shame because we actually liked who you were. <laughs> that's why we promoted you. On the other hand, we can all continue our own development by taking and observing other people. Sometimes observing things you don't want to do, uh, but many times observing things that you do want to do. I would just tell people not, and I think I've tried to do this in my own development, not model myself off of any one person in particular but recognize certain qualities, certain approaches, and see if they work well in your sort of uh, toolkit of style. And probably the most important of anything is just total academic curiosity all the time. Just all the time, sort of, well, why? Because if it isn't sort of that, then you're not really, really leading anything. You're just sort of doing what's been done before. Mm. What advice would you give to students who want to become great leaders? Uh, well, I would tell them, first of all, to start that uh, observation period early. You know, do, be yourself. But we all, you know, development is sort of, I'm sure there are texts on that and better articulated than I'll do. But observe around you all the time, whether it's situations or people, how something was handled, learn. To me, case studies of anything, whether it's related to your uh, field of uh, work or in, uh, in society in general, just learning from case studies and asking yourself or getting with some of your best friends or colleagues or whatever they might be, so sort of saying, how would you have handled that? And building up that library of situations, because one of the things that became very clear to me is that as a leader, you don't get a lot of time to think through all of the possible outcomes. You're on the spot. So you've got to have started to prepare to be a leader almost continuously. And I think a lot of your students have already started, they may not know it, but they really need to sort of be reasonably disciplined about sort of, how would I have handled that? Even if it's something the President of the United States is handling, how would I have handled that? And just get that and be, start conditioning yourself for being on the spot and trying to make decisions that preserve your values and the, uh, the integrity that we're taught as an engineer. What can universities do to support leadership development? Actually, I, I'm a big advocate of, uh, I think there is room here, I, I, the senior projects and the uh, kinds of dissertations and so on and so forth are a really good uh, help. So students that can actually partner up with businesses regardless of the uh, field of interest and start to take on a project as opposed to just sort of be there, but really take some leadership for a particular project and realize what it means to sort of organize the resources underneath that, to get results, report the results and then influence others to get those results effectively heard. I think the universities are doing a great job on that, but I think that's something that probably wasn't as true in my education. It was a little bit more of a formal education, but I think as I look back, I take more away from the opportunities to have actually applied that in the university setting. It's almost like do the learning, but then use the university setting to critique some of the more practical work. And mm -hmm. I think. Uh, all of us should just take the opportunity because uh, practicing leadership is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. How has globalization impacted leadership? That's a trickier one. We're uh, more of a domestic company, although it's just in China uh, two weeks ago. And I think our own leadership styles have to sort of recognize that there are cultural differences, even when there are many more similarities than there are differences in a particular field of business or a particular uh, engineering discipline. But there are cultural differences, and leadership needs to sort of get a handle to what those cultural differences are, respect them, and then use them to our advantage, uh, versus trying to sort of say, well, we do it this way, we do it that way. 
uh, that's unlikely to be long-term successful and probably blocking out what could be a, a very nice interchange. So for me, uh, I haven't had a great deal of influence uh, in other countries from a leadership perspective, although I think perhaps even coming from another country, it, it allows you first and foremost to just respect different cultures. And that, that I think is a big deal to just uh, get that respect and then see how we can leverage it from there. What key events or people were instrumental in putting you on the path to leadership? You know, I've been asked that question so many times, I wish I had a really perfect answer, but uh, my answers are probably a little less uh, dramatic than you might think. I, was, uh, I had the opportunity as a young child to sort of work with uh, a farmer who wasn't uh, really a family member, and the farmer in this particular case probably had never really had any appreciation for anyone under the age of 20, uh, and I was eight. And just the way that I think he interacted with me, managed me, expected me to step up, uh, huge influence. And I think that what I took away from that is not that it was tough at all, but it was always putting something out in front of you that you have to sort of strive for. And I suspect that uh, in this case, he's never going to write any books on management, but remarkably, it was all there uh, in its own way. Then I think there have been a couple of situations, one here at the University of Florida that uh, was very influ influential. I didn't enter the University of Florida in a traditional way and uh, sort of got invited uh, in after introducing myself to a professor and uh, that was just uh, what turned out to be just an incredible start. Uh, I think it's just so important to realize that starting can be from meager starts you could actually develop and I think we've got to be very careful to uh, to look out for people who have the right aptitude, but maybe not necessarily the right means to uh, exploit that. Um, and then in business, there's been a couple of individuals that uh, I've observed. I, I like pieces of their uh, style, and you try to build that into, uh, into your style. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us this afternoon. Thank you. It's been great.